Good afternoon, AI fans, and welcome back to beautiful San Jose, California. We're here at NVIDIA GTC with exclusive coverage for theCUBE. My name's Savannah Peterson. Very excited to be joined by this panel of brilliant human beings, Andy, Shri, and Andrew. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you very much for having us. Thanks for being here. Thank you know, you this for is us. super fun. Shri, you and I have got a thing going on now. I just chatted with you at MWC in Barcelona, but you've already made progress since I saw you literally days ago. Talk to me about your Agentic news. AI is changing by the hour, right? Yes, so it is, baby. Agentic AI, which is kind of the tip of the spear center. I mean, Jensen talked it up this morning. We hold the world's leading score on Gaia Benchmark, which is the generalized AI assistant. That's a big deal. Here's what happened since we met. Not just DeepSeek, Manus AI came out and outgunned the state of the art, which is our own score, and OpenAI. And so what we did over the last couple of, uh, couple of days is unseat OpenAI, and so we are the US counterpart, US response to AI coming from China at this point in generalized AI assistance. Agentic AI is how we're going to take kind of value from AI, from LLMs and generative AI. When intelligence becomes ubiquitous, agency becomes valuable. And I think with agency, you can ground generative AI from and, and make it really useful for businesses. And that's what we are so excited to at the next step. Absolutely. Shri, I'll, I'll jump in real quick. Yes, so please. We have a win as well. It's not on an agentic AI leaderboard, but it is an agentic process that actually is number one in the world as well on the Bird SQL benchmark. So the ability to take human language, turn it into computer language to do complex analytics accurately, number one over the likes of Google and Alibaba and IBM Research and Stanford. So uh, good company. No, it's fantastic. How's the view from the top? And one of the interesting aspect from one of the interesting aspects, very, very scary, because every <laughs> every hour counts. <laughs> right, Literally, we yeah. were good, best in class this morning, and that's how we woke up last 12 years, best in class this morning, but maybe not tomorrow, so we're continuously innovating. The teams behind this work have been working relentlessly, whether it's our top uh, technologists, data scientists, Kaggle Grandmasters, John, uh, Arnos, superstars, working relentlessly to still keep, keep pace, just be, one inch ahead of the of the competition on the bird sql benchmark just to be more um, yeah to highlight a little it's asking questions on your data and then translating it to sql and getting back responses one of the collaboration we've been working on there is distilling and fine tuning so distilling using large language models and fine tuning small models so the cost of ai becomes much much more uh, lower and also response times, latencies for small models are faster. So that's another place we've been collaborating. Yeah, I mean, just really quick working yeah, with, tell like, us more working about with it. Sri and the HTO team, like we have done that and taken some really large use cases where um, we were spending a lot of money, at, at, even at the ATT scale. Uh, now, with a fine tuned small language model delivering almost the accuracy of a large language model at less than 10% of the cost. That's so, a really big deal when yeah. we're talking about full scale transformation. ATT, just a few customers. I'm an AT&T customer, yes. as a matter of fact. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> but, I, but I mean, Shri and I were talking, one of the things we're really passionate about is where AI actually touches human beings. Everybody has a phone, everybody goes to the bank, or at least most people go to the bank. I suppose there might be some rebels out there. But I think I think that's really interesting. So talk to me about what that process has been like and, and what the innovation has looked like to be able to fine tune that down to get that to 10% of the cost, because that makes the, that matters. That's the difference between doing it and not doing it at your scale, I would imagine. No, for, for sure. I mean, every Everything that we do is based on an ROI basis, like we look at the value that we're creating and what we're spending to do that, and really prioritizing what makes a difference for AT&T and our customers. And you're right, what things that we can do to make the, the customer experience better, uh, we're very focused on that. So everything from the experience on the digital side, from the experience in the call center, to, uh, to just how we do things more efficiently, to, to, make, to run the network better. All those things are now you know, uh, driven with uh, Agentic uh, solutions and, and, and generative AI solutions to make that process better. That's, that's exciting. Are you seeing something, I mean, banks, yes. fraud, so many things that happen on in your world, so many things that most people are afraid of, but hopefully going to be able to leverage AI to prevent. Are you seeing some of the same stuff? That's exactly right, and building on uh, some of the things that Andy and AT&T are working on, we, for the last four or five years, have been partnering with H2O.AI to build what we call our customer engagement engine, 
So we went from having a few thousand models running over 157 billion data points in real time. <laughs> so that in every engagement that we have with you, we know who you are. We're uh, doing the right things. The service experience is great. It's all real time across all our channels, all the different relationships that you might have with us. Um, we've gone from thousands of models to multiple, multiple thousands on trillions of data points, working with H2O.ai to be able to improve both our experience, but you mentioned fraud. In fraud and scams over the last uh, 12 months, we've reduced uh, fraud losses by over 30% for our customers. We've reduced scam losses by over 70%. Those and are really significant numbers. That's using the great models that Shri and the team come up with just to help our customers have a better experience. So how often are you iterating with Shri and the team at H2O AI to continue evolving these models and, and continue driving those kinds of numbers? Well, to Shri's point, I think it's a, a daily, now hourly race to kind of be better than either be better than your competition, but also be better than the bad actors if you're talking about well, fraud exactly. and scams. You both have to deal with that, I would imagine. We do. So it's, it's like Andy and I do talk a little bit as well. It's continuous learning, right? So you've got to have real-time monitoring on everything that you're doing. And if one of the models is not performing as well as you think it should, the model owner will get a real-time alert and they'll go and address it and work with the H2O team to work out what we need to do. I love that. These are two of my most mature, advanced customers in banking and telco, leaders in their space, but it's not just AI, they've led a unique set of high learning rate culture in their teams, and they've not just, like it's sometimes, like it's not even the tools, we, we feel privileged to be partnering with both AT&T and Connell Bank, I mean these are relationships for almost a decade since I started the company, but they've been watching, work, supporting our open source, supporting our platform in automatic machine learning, and now with generative AI, they've been the leading force in trying to give us continuous feedback, because the feedback is gold, and that feedback loop we're getting from AT&T and ComBank is what's really pioneering the future of our AI. Well, it's priceless. I mean, that's how you build the future, is listening to what the future needs. It's a pretty interesting challenge. All right, so I got, I'm curious. You both obviously have massive teams. And, and so what is it like when you roll out these solutions from H2O AI and integrate them into the teams? What's the reception like? I'll start with you, Andy. Yeah, so I mean, the, the focus at H&T, right, is to really have you know, a very deliberate you know, set of architecture that we use, uh, best in class. Again, we prove it based on value. Um, and make sure that we democratize that across the company, right? So that as we develop these patterns and these processes, that we know we don't have re, we don't have duplication, and we really just have reuse, right? So that we we develop once and use multiple times. That's how we're driving value. So it's really about education, evangelization, and just showing the value. Would Actually, you agree? I, I got. A a little bit of a funny story on this one. When oh, let's hear it, Andrew. We started working with H2O.ai about five years ago, and we were trying the product against all other things that were available in the market. So the driverless AI means that you can use H2O, you can build an AI model, no one's coding. So very impressive. But we were looking at it, and my science team for six months were going, it doesn't feel right that this product can build better models than we can. And I allowed them six months to try and rip it apart to see what, and basically it was just a better product, the way the Kaggle Grandmasters had built it meant it was better at doing AI models. And thereafter, uh, I bet everyone in the CBA, everyone who works for CBA, if they wanted to build a model on their own, and I could use H2O, the winner of that would get a dinner in any restaurant that they chose across the world. Oh, I see how you're incentivizing this. I have this. yet to pay for dinner. Oh, wow. So we're, we're certainly very happy with our partnership with H2O.ai. One, one of the unique aspects, I asked, I mean, this is a... Uh, I'm not taking you to Vegas. This is a, this is a uh, regrouping of, of the three of us doing a fireside chat in Bangalore, where we democratized open source or H2O GPT almost two years ago. And I think uh, at the time I asked Andy, what kind of value you've gotten from AI? And at the time it was roughly $2 billion. And since then, I think it's gone even much, much more. Yeah, you want to answer that question? Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's we have a very <laughs> like we're, we're building on uh, like a very rich uh, history of traditional AI uh, with generative AI and agentic AI, and we have a very disciplined program. So we take use cases across the company, uh, we bring those to uh, a central pool, we evaluate those with a very close peer of mine on the business side, and we make sure we do a business case, and we make sure we do we work on the ones that matter the most to the company. 
And by doing that, we can assess the cost and the return um, and that value. One thing we can say right now, uh, I'll talk about it in our panel tomorrow, but last year, you know, this is kind of, I think, rare in the space. We returned 2X uh, ROI, free cash flow impacting ROI on every dollar that we spent with Generative AI last year. And so that was a one year return. Wow. These are three year business cases. So, uh, the, the, you know, it's a very important uh, lever we have at ATT. I, I just got to call that out for a second. There's a lot of companies still trying to achieve sizable ROI in, in a few instances or a couple different MVPs. You're able to do that on $2, $2 for every $1 spent on generative AI, if I just heard you correctly. Last year. Wow. In that, year. That is yeah. very impressive. But I can imagine that's only going to accelerate. Oh yeah, these these are three-year business cases. So even that two X will grow, and then we're investing more. So um, a, a testament to the team at AT&T. How do you determine? You mentioned that you you focus on the use cases that are best for the business, most important to the business. I can imagine there's a lot of shareholders who might be vying for their business case to be the most important. How do you deliberate on what to work on first? What's that well, process like? It's a formal business case, uh, you know, where we put financials against it, the expectations against it, what we think we can do to improve processes or gen generate revenue. And then we work with our CFO office, right? They're committing, right, to, to be part of that development pool. They're committing to return that value back to the company. So that's how we track it. Like this is very disciplined and very deliberate on how we run this program. Is it a similar process for you all internally? It's a similar process in understanding what the most important things are. We're very focused on customer uh, net promoter score, customer experience. So for us, every use case of significant value is, uh, are we de delivering new products and experiences faster than our competitors? Uh, are we given a customer experience which is superior and differential? So we measure all of that. And in the last 12 months, we've actually doubled the number of new releases into production across the enterprise. Uh, using the investments we've made in AI across the estate, and we've increased quality significantly as well. Experience? We have we have been improving month on month our net promoter score for all customer segments across the enterprise. That's got to feel pretty good. It's pretty good. It keeps the team motivated to do more and keep pushing. Yeah. And the other thing they have done really is democratize AI within the organizations. Ooh, so tell me business more about that. teams are actually like. The business bank is using AI with uh, building agents for their own contact centers. They're building kind of agents in different, from all the way from loans to different portions of the bank. And same thing, I mean, the, the democratization across the organizations, not just, I mean, these are the top, like I would put them in the most coveted people to talk to and learn from how to bring transformation with AI, but they've actually democratized it within their own organizations. Well, you're enabling everyone to become a creator with these new tools rather than just saying, hey, go use this new software or implement this new thing. And I can imagine that's an empowering, purpose-driving sense of that's work exactly right. for all the t people on the team. Just to build on that, right, over the last 12 months, we actually trained uh, 900 of our analysts to use H2O.AI. Um, and what that means is that, you know, we talked about fraud and scams, but you think about every decision we make in our customers, and we make millions of decisions every day, the price, credit decision, et cetera, what experience, what offer, how to package up a bundle for you, what to show you in the app. And in every one of those, we're making those decisions 100% better using H2O.AI than the previous models. Casual number there. Yes. 100 percent better, 100 percent better every time. Who doesn't want to be 100 percent better every time? And, I, and, yeah. the, and the competitions you used to run to get people really good at it, like we had yeah. master classes, but within at and the culture, like everybody wanted to be better than the others, so they would run a competition continuously on every problem and give a payout and get people really good at that. So there's almost like a gamification that subtly happens when people are empowered. That's a really fun anecdote, Trey. When, you, when I think of watching other technological revolutions transpire, it wasn't always that thrilling or necessarily gamified for the folks who were on the front lines of that. So, yeah. 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 And the barrier of entry now is very different, right? You don't have to be a code wizard, right, to, do, to really contribute. Um, with generative AI and even the agentic platform that we've created, you know, once the, the, the process that will be created you know, and developed, it can be used throughout any part of the company. All parts of the firm will benefit. Uh, oh, we, we made all our predictive power an agent inside generative AI. So people can, with English, can call and make code happen, and along with code, call predictions right, so on your data or even business intelligence on your data. So it really makes the life of a business analyst or someone with a purpose go change the world faster. 
And talking about that. You know how passionate we both are about changing the world faster for good. I have one final question for each of you to answer. On that note, precisely, one of the things that I recognized in Sri right away when we started talking was the commitment to these tools going towards the right causes and not towards nefarious things. Y'all are obviously leaders in your field. What is your one piece of advice for the world, for founders, for companies, for folks going through this transformation to help preserve this technology in a space that is good for all versus nefarious and maybe just capitalistically driven? I'm going to start with you, Andy, because we're making eye contact. Yes. No, no, it's good. Uh, I'm, I mean, Look, just by the nature of, of, of being good at AI, we find a lot of great uh, applications for it that, do good, that does good for society. We talked about fraud, you know, helping our customers, you know, protecting them from, from the threats that they have. You know, we use AI a lot in how we dispatch our vehicles, which saves, you know, miles driven and, and carbon emissions, you know, uh, spent. You know, we use it for how we, you know, manage the climate threats that we have yes. and how we spend energy. I mean, one of the great Gen AI use cases we have in the network space is cutting network power by, I think, almost 30%, you know, in, you know, on off-peak periods. So, really great applications that, that serve the good for, for humanity. Oh, I'd love to hear yeah. it. All right, Andy, you're if, in the next. Wow, well, if only we had more time, because I think you've got to lead through your actions uh, and use AI for good. And we have so many examples at Combank where the team, on their own discretion, right, the, there is no need for me to ask the team to work weekends to save lives with the Red Cross, as an example. Um, to actually get to customers, we get to customers across Australia before they are impacted by a natural disaster. So wow. we're, we're faster than the uh, weather services uh, associations in Australia. And letting customers know something's about to happen. Just remember, we're here. We've got all these emergency services. They're all available for you. Just let us know. Okay, that's super impressive. We're going to have to put a pin in that and do a whole show on that <laughs> awesome. at some point because that is fascinating. And when I think of first responders, I do not think of the bank. <laughs> and no offense, but now I will think of the bank. Thanks to you, Andrew. Yeah. I really appreciate that. All right, Shri, your closing words on that. You know, we started the company because my mom had breast cancer. I wanted to fight cancer with AI. And uh, we want, I named it Edge 2 so it can be ubiquitous and everywhere. I think it, it's a privilege to be on the show floor of one of the largest AI conference with one of my top customers. Through our users and through our customers, we really can change the world even more. Uh, anyone starting today should know that AI is a true co-founder for them in their purpose. It can really, if you truly believe it, believe in your customers. Customer love is one of the greatest force in the world. And that's what got carried us this far. Customers invested in us when no one else believed in AI back in the day. Jensen invested in us when no one else believed in back in the day. And we are, uh, it, it's, it's basically follow your heart. That's roughly what I would say. Despite intelligence is ubiquitous, uh, agency becomes very important. So if you, something's calling you, um, follow it and then maybe the world will open up in there. And AI will be that true, true transformation. So. Beautifully stated, Sri, as usual. Thank you so much for curating these guests and bringing your friends on the show. Andy and Andrew, thank you both so much. This has been fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope you all have an excellent rest of the show. Thank you. So grateful. For I hope you're all feeling company. as inspired as I am after this power-packed panel. We're here at NVIDIA GTC in San Jose, California. My name's Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for enterprise tech news.